Good afternoon, folks. Um, it's about 1.35, so I'd like to get us started. Um, I know we're a small group right now, but I expect other people will come in as lunch is ending. Um, my name is Kelly Strunk. I work here at Bryn Mawr College with our Civic Engagement Office, and I'm going to be introducing um, our presenters for this hour and 15 minute workshop, Crossing the Rubicon, Introducing Fully Online Courses into the Curriculum of a Traditional Liberal Arts College. This is, if you're you know, a college student going to class and you're in the right class, you're good. <laughs> online learning is already a staple of higher education, but where does online learning fit in the context of a small, primarily residential liberal arts college? Today, we're joined by faculty and staff from the Sales University to discuss the integration of two online courses into the curriculum for traditional day students. They consider the reason for the program, challenges and opportunities, and the effect on factors such as student performance. Joining us today are Brennan Purcell, Professor of History, Christopher Hewitt, uh, the instructional designer paired with Dr. Purcell, and Dr. Eric Hagan, director of the university's instructional technology department. They're going to invite questions throughout the workshop, um, so please enjoy. All right, great, thank you. Uh, there was some setting on the lights that were a little bit far oh, yes. but yeah, they were, they... yeah, so uh, we'll explain a little bit about our project, but, um, and you know, since there's a few people, again, we'll be informal and feel free to blurt out a question at any any time and if it's something we we're going to cover later we'll just say hang on a minute so uh, here we go so all right so there's the three of us who just heard about us and I'll we'll put up our names again if you want to at the end if you want to get in contact with us so here's what we we're going to cover and again we'll be flexible if we need to go a different direction so a little bit about the context of our university so you can see how it relates to your own you know, what was the objective of this particular project one of the issues was getting faculty involved and on board, especially because we wanted to use our, our full-time kind of core faculty to be on this project. Uh, why did students enroll in the course? Uh, where we are with the project and what we're planning to do for next year. A little bit about the development process and the faculty perspective on developing and teaching the course. And then certainly time for questions, but like you said, we'll do that throughout. So I'm kind of representing, uh, you might say, the administrator perspective on this. Chris, the instructional mm -hmm. designer, and uh, Brennan, the faculty. All right, so here's a little bit about the sales. So the sales is the Lehigh Valley, it's Catholic University. We're near Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, our traditional day enrollments, uh, a little under 1,700, about two thirds of the students live in residence halls on campus. But we also have, uh, we have three student populations. We have that traditional day population. We also have a very vibrant and longstanding adult undergraduate education program and graduate programs, and both of those latter populations are increasingly online. So we retain our emphasis on the liberal arts and sciences as far as the core curriculum, but a lot of the programs now that the students are enrolling in and the particular students we are attracting are very uh, related to directly career-related majors, and some of the popular ones, most popular in business, nursing and healthcare, and our kind of special niche is the performing arts. Um, but, so we had a lot of familiarity and experience among the faculty with online courses because of our adult education program and our graduate program, but the day students, the traditional day as we call them, they were prohibited from taking uh, online classes except on kind of an exception basis. Maybe they would take them in the summer or maybe because of some special graduation requirement they would be allowed to take one of the adult uh, education courses, but by and large they were precluded from doing it except as on an exception basis. And the theory, I, I think, historically was Oh, people didn't send their children to go to this residential college in order to sit in their dorm rooms and take online classes. So as we'll see, that changed a little bit as time went on. So uh, this uh, objective and why we're doing this project is now enshrined in the university's five-year strategic plan and kind of began a little bit before that. So the objective that we were trying to meet with this project was to provide the traditional day students with the opportunity to complete up to two fully online courses as part of their undergraduate degree program. So now this is going to be a departure from the historic practice and as part of their regular schedule, you know, they were going to be able to take during their whole four years up to two online courses. And so the, the thinking of the university powers that be changed from what I said before about uh, not allowing you know, students to take online classes from their dorm rooms to the uh, thinking that maybe we were putting our students at a competitive disadvantage 
uh, and we needed to do this because we wanted to strengthen the students' preparation for, for graduate study, which even at the sales and many other places was online, and certainly professional development in the workplace also being online. So the thought was, well, if they've had no online experience, they're going to graduate and be you know, at a disadvantage. And also another reason was to provide flexibility for the students to pursue internships, co-ops, other things like that. So to give them some schedule flexibility. You know, we have a lot of nursing students that were doing clinical rotations and just having a little wiggle room through this online class with a, you know, a facilitated scheduling. So that was our uh, kind of, this is the project and the objective we're trying to meet. So I'm curious of the group here, have conversations similar to this occurred on your campuses? Um, is it our, is our former policy of not letting students take online classes common? You know, how has this been talked about or discussed? So, I represent Butler in Indianapolis, and uh, we only offer online classes in the summer. And um, basically, the reason behind that was because a lot of our students were taking classes elsewhere in the summer, right. and the school was losing money. <laughs> so mm -hmm. they had no choice but to, you know, offer something. So begrudgingly. Grudgingly offered. Right, in a perfect yeah. world, they wouldn't be taking the online classes, right. but since we're losing money on it anyway, we might as well. Right. Same thing, offering. Right. Okay. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. And actually, that was a motivator at, at the sales. They did this year, we had a winter session, a very compressed, um, accelerated uh, winter session, but that part of the motivation was the same. That, uh, and, and the traditional day students were allowed. Did you, did you teach them that? The winter? No. Oh, some right. of the other people did. That, uh, you know, again, we were losing money to these other institutions, so we might as well capture some of it ourselves. So, I'm in. Again, we're in Austin. Again, um, we know you. You're famous. You're the yeah. famous. So, but we're independent Catholic, very similar programs, although I think we're a little bit larger in size. But um, and we did have a ban, right? Traditional undergrads, very much traditional liberal arts, they cannot take classes in New College, although with our adult degree completion rate. Um, but part of the reasoning was also that um, they would interrupt the dynamic of the adult students, but they would be intimidating. Which I think is an interesting dynamic to think about now because as we get more transfer students, some of those are older as well. But at the same time, we are having a growing interest in if we can use online offerings to make it possible for students to do more study abroad and other. I mean, and so that second bullet point I think really resonates um, across campus. So what can we do to make more cycle? And of course, yeah, we'd also like we've now started offering our capstone, Gen Ed capstone online. Which I'll be teaching in the fall, and part of it was we had students who that's all they needed to finish, and they had left. You know, this is the one thing keeping you from getting your degree, and gosh, it would help our six year retention numbers if you would just finish that out. Yeah. So I, I should say too that the, the classes that ended up being developed under this initiative were, you know, normally our online classes for the adults or the graduate studies tended to be these accelerated formats, like eight weeks. We have eight weeks, six weeks. 12 weeks, something like that. These classes were full term, 16 week uh, online classes for three credits. Um, so that was different. And they were only for the traditional day students. So we didn't just mix them up into the, the other classes. These were classes specifically intended for this population. So does anybody else want to comment? Or? Well, bring more, yeah, okay. uh, which I guess just the three of us uh, represent. Um, still is, you know, in your earlier. Um, situation where we really feel part of our brand and our identity is that in-person uh, relationship between our faculty and our students. So I don't see us moving in this direction for our undergraduate program. Obviously, we've embraced blended learning, but sure. probably won't be going fully online anytime in the foreseeable future. However, where we do have very strong interest is with our graduate school of social work. Yeah. And specifically, there are some certification and uh, continuing edu education credits that they're very interested in moving online and for obvious reasons are dealing with professionals right. uh, you know many of whom have full-time jobs and simply need to continue their their certification for their fields yeah okay yeah that, that's good so yeah. Um, yeah so a lot of diff different approaches taken and uh, anyway we're still still learning which is the great fun of this field so so one of the initial um, challenges was finding faculty to collaborate under, you know, what sort of deal or what sort of circumstances was going to make this everybody <laughs> get volunteers to, to do this, uh, or how much did you have to pay to get the volunteers or whatever you want to talk about. So 
from the administrative perspective, the priorities were, of course, to meet this objective now that it was on the books, but uh, you know, they wanted to, to have classes developed in this way that would be frequently scheduled, high enrollment courses, kind of the core courses, so that once they were developed, there'd be sort of bang for the buck that you know, this development effort could be, it could be uh, used or scaled in some way. Of course, they wanted them to be high quality, something that the university would be proud of. They wanted them to be reusable uh, by the same faculty member or a different one. So that was a little bit of maybe a rub. And cost control in terms of, they wanted the end result of this to not be an ongoing increase in the cost of instruction. Which again, this is still something we're I think perhaps working out, although I'm not sure the administration, I guess I'm representing the administration is, what is going to agree to. So these, the way this played out was the classes were capped at the same enrollment caps that that same class would be if it was on campus, which in our case for the particular classes that ran this term that just ended was 30, which is a big online class, some would say. So because it was on campus, it was 30. So that was the logic. Um, anyway, so the way we, so, there was a, it was a lot more difficult than I thought since I was involved to some extent in this recruiting effort to find people that wanted to do this and for all the reasons that have been uh, talked about in some of the previous sessions. Uh, you know, it's more work. People are used to doing things in a certain way. But eventually we came up with a, some people that were interested and then we started talking under what circumstances would you do this. So we ended up with a written agreement or a contract, kind of a, a course development subject matter expert agreement contract. And we tried to address the points that the you know, faculty members thought were important, and they actually had an independent review of the contract by you know somebody, a lawyer outside, uh, who's actually one of the faculty members, I think, brought up. Uh, they looked at it, so we had some you know external look at it. But you know, we decided that the course would be defined as a joint work product. So it talks about how it's kind of jointly owned by the faculty member in the university because the faculty <coughs> members obviously uh, contributing the content and the university is contributing through the instructional design efforts, some of the look and feel and the structure and the learning management system and stuff like that. So we all have a you know, skin in the game. The faculty members were compensated for course development in addition to teaching the course. So there was a, a payment made there. Uh, the third one seemed to be important at first, especially, was that the person that developed the course kind of gets first dibs on teaching the course. So there was some uh, perhaps fear that uh, this was a effort to you know, have the full-time faculty member develop the course, but then a bunch of adjuncts are going to teach the course. Um, that really wasn't the intention, but if that wasn't the intention, then we should be able to put it in writing that it's not, so we did. So the faculty members subject, of course, to their whole scheduling you know, in their departments and things like that, but other things being equal, the faculty member that makes the course gets first rights to teach the course going forward. And in fact, we wanted them to teach the course at least the first couple times so they could continue to improve it. Um, the agreement to find circumstances under which other instructors could use the course. So it was things like, obviously, the faculty member leaves, if there's multiple sections, or the faculty member doesn't want to do it anymore, things like that. Um, and then this was another thing that maybe wouldn't work in all places, but we, again, another compromise is that we gave the faculty members the ability to designate up to a third of the course material as personal and not for use by another instructor. So if, for example, they wanted to and if it was less than a third of the course, you know, their likeness, their image, their voice, if, if they wanted to say, you know, you can use the basic structure of this course, instructor number two, but I don't really want you teaching with my face or my voice. And as long as that was agreed upon to be less than a third, then they could say that part could be reused. So anyway, this was our unique in our institutional context formula that seemed like it was acceptable to everybody, the university and to the faculty members. And it seems like everybody's happy with this. Um, arrangement. So we got our first three people to sign on to develop these courses. And then um, from the student side, this was a survey that we did at the very beginning of the term. This, these three class, it was three classes that ran five sections. Brendan's course had three sections, it was so popular. Um, and so at the beginning of the term, we got 59 students to answer a survey out of probably around maybe 100 and yeah, probably 150, 140 students, so a yeah, pretty good sample. So this was asking them, why did they enroll in the course? So this is this uh, population of students. And we asked them two different ways. One set was, what was the most important reason you enrolled? And which of, so you can only pick one. And then the other was, which of these factors contributed to your uh, enrolling in this course? So you could pick as many of these as you wanted. So you can see that the most important reason was the schedule flexibility idea. That was the motivation of the students. 
Second was meeting a group degree requirement. Some people like the particular instructor and some of the things at the tail end were, I learned better in online classes. So that was maybe good that they didn't think that. The online classes are typically easier, so that at least showed they didn't have that misconception. Um, so at least for the most important reason, it wasn't the experience of taking an online course. But you can see the results are somewhat different when they could pick as many as they wanted. So they you know, picked flexibility, meeting the degree requirement clearly, but some of the other ones popped up higher, like other flexibility for work. And then taking the experience of an online course was a contributing factor, although not the most important. Um, so anyway, I mean, nothing super surprising. One thing that was surprising, we did some demographics of the students and asked them some questions too. One of the things I was surprised at personally, knowing the profile of our campus, full-time students, uh, two-thirds of them residential, was how many of them had work outside of school. It was many. Um, uh, and another thing we learned is that very few of them, perhaps giving my other preamble, this isn't surprising, had ever taken an online course before, at least in college, because there would have had to been some exception. So they didn't have any experience of online courses in higher education before. All right, so we had uh, three different classes. One was uh, Dr. Andrew Essick. His course was a uh, political science course, Central European Nations. Uh, another one was Introduction to Fiction by Julian Osborne McVeigh. That's her there. And then the third one was World History from 1500 with Brandon Purcell, who you're going to hear from in a, in a moment. So, uh, and we use Blackboard, which really gets beat up. It's a terrible looking boy around here. Every time Blackboard is mentioned, there's like spinning. <laughs> it works okay for us. I, I can't say anything negative about it. So anyway, that's my administrative preamble. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Chris to talk a little bit about the instructional designer perspective. So coming in from this perspective, I've worked a lot with the access course for some of their non-traditional students, setting up those online and hybrid collaborations, and worked with some of our MBA program for setting up some of their graduate courses. So it's like, how do we take what we're currently utilizing, what works best in these online and hybrid settings, and how do we apply these to the potential learning objectives and expectations of traditional day students who haven't experienced this type of learning before? Because it's something that you know has been mentioned before, mentioned again this morning, we assume a lot from these digital natives. That is a term that gets thrown around a lot. Just because they have the technology doesn't know, mean that they actually know how to use it critically, especially in an academic setting. I am totally surprised at how many people come into these types of courses, you ask them to do a research paper, and the last thing they think of is what's right in front of their face the whole time. And then not only getting to those materials, but utilizing them correctly. So coming out from that perspective, we had to decide, you know, how much do we want to give them before we try to overload their senses? Because there's only so much that you can provide them with a new academic experience or new tools before they get frustrated. And I'm sure that many of you might have heard about Chief Set Mahai and the concept of flow. We really didn't want students coming in here really anxious and then just like losing confidence within the first two weeks and saying, this is a horrible experience. Because as a first impression for a trial project, for piloting something like that, it could crash everything. So I, right out of the gate, decided, you know, we need to set up a sort of like quasi or pseudo orientation process that they need to complete before they even unlock the course content in the online setting. So Brennan and I, Dr. Purcell and I, kind of collaborated to set up, you know, a folder when you walk into the course within the weekly units that here's your student orientation. Is online learning right for you? So it steps them through the process of how to use Blackboard, all the tools that we will be working with, to sample ideas and snippets from each of these, to gauge their interaction. And we'd also gone a step further to we'd allowed them access to these courses one week prior to the actual start date. So that way, if there are any technical difficulties or any questions, we could kind of like fish those out of the water before the course actually began. And someone gets two weeks in and goes, I'm having computer difficulties, or you respond to lockdown browser, you know, I can't use this software. And the amount of feedback and response that we got from students within that first week was fantastic. Because the ones who did have difficulties, I invited them directly into my office. Said, look, if you're having a computer issue, if you're having problems, 
come to me, let's get it fixed, let's get you in this course on the right foot. So that was a lot of good turnout from that. And also in that same regard, the amount of students who had issues and turned up, very few. A lot less than what we had expected. So it was great that they actually all kind of responded to this as well too, because we instantly told them, Respondus Lockdown Browser will be utilized for all online assessments, and so will the Respondus Monitor software, which actually records students as they take their test in an online environment. Our initial thought was, <coughs> there might be some pushback from this, you know, being recorded, taking an assessment, but then there was also that prevailing sense of, you're working with a generation that is constantly on FaceTime, on social media, and are already putting themselves out there anyway. And then it was great because we've actually started now going back now that the course is completed, auditing some of these recordings. Within moments of completing that webcam check, they zone out. Like they just they focus in on the test. They you can tell that they are even they forget they're being recorded. So that's just out of their heads. So stepping on from some of the right tools for the job and things like that. We want to make sure that it's an online course. So we don't want to necessarily try and emulate or mimic the traditional classroom setting. Because if you try and do that, you're gonna fail. There is a difference. So we want to make this a unique experience that still caters to the DeSales University goals and our mission. So we utilize the Panopto Focus Recorder software to get Brennan's presence, the instructor presence in the course as much as possible. So that way the students know they have a mentor, they have a guide on the other side of this gateway for knowledge who cares about them, who wants to see them succeed. And then, like I mentioned, the student technical support issues. If at any time throughout the course, 16 weeks, three sections, I made myself fully and openly available to any students who had any <coughs> issues that might have arisen. I told them, you know, contact me by email, here's my uh, office number, get in touch with me through my extension, We'll work out any issues that you have. And I had a couple of students who throughout the semester like would just come to me and just follow up and say, hey, you know, I'm doing this, am I doing the right steps? All very courteous, all engaged with me about, you know, like, you know I want to succeed in this course, help me, help me, bring me along with you. And what's also great about this is with these digital natives, as much as that term gets flung around, having this technology they expect immediate feedback and response all the time. That's how they've grown up, that's how they expect it, and that's how it's gonna move forward. And that's the thing that is taking place in a lot of graduate programs in the professional world now as well, is that you can shoot out an email to a global community and get that type of response. So using that, we could adjust the course in real time. So we would actually, you know, on a weekly basis, follow up with the students and see how things were going along. And if something didn't work the previous week, the instructor could make an adjustment and change that for the upcoming week. And it was all based on student feedback and response. It's no longer teach for a few weeks, give a quiz as an assessment, and then figure out, uh-oh, 75% of the class is missing out on this core concept, you know, now we're falling behind, how do we adjust moving forward and still meet that initial goal and deadline of these objectives that we want to meet? And you know, now that the uh, term is finished, we have three sections completed, almost 90 students went through the course, you know, where do we go from here? And the great part about this is in instructional design, we have something that's known as the ADDI model. And the best part about it is, is that it's a model for you know, analyzing, designing, developing, implementing, and the most, to me, integral part, evaluating. And it's a circle, it's continuous. That doesn't mean we're just one and done, let's just run it again. With all the data and feedback <coughs> that we've collected, we can continue to improve this course. And we can continue to now adapt what worked, what didn't work, into the upcoming iterations. And then hopefully spread these among the other courses that we have in mind at the university. And for me, that's pretty much what I had there, and that was my role that I played. So at this point, I think I'll turn it over to Dr. Purcell, and we'll uh, get the instructor's viewpoint. Thanks, Chris, for having this <laughs> Yes, Doctor. Yeah. All right, faculty perspective. Course design process. Why, did I, why was I so enthusiastic for this? Um, I suppose I'm not your typical kind of professor. Um, 
probably make other PhD and publish the books and got tenure and all the rest of it. But then the financial crisis happened. I didn't understand anything about that. So they started taking MBA classes, fundamental classes, about well, about economics, finance. I got hooked. So I did, it didn't cost me anything at the sales, so I got the MBA done. I did it half live and half online. And I had some great online learning experiences and some disastrous ones. You've got to be kidding. So um, um, I, I don't, I spend, you know, my, my main job is a university position, but my family, my friends, and then my own consulting experiences, I'm, I'm pretty well tuned in to, I think, a certain sector that maybe some of my colleagues are not. And I'm, I'm very passionate about the utility of the college experience, to especially the, the, the sales student body. 40% uh, of our students for decades come from families who have never gone to college. So they're the first. They are under a lot of pressure to get up and get a job. So here I'm a professor of history. I'm teaching this thing online, mostly to nursing and PAs who don't have time for it. This is the last day they put in the bag. So I don't waste any time talking about the utility of history as such. But I do tell them that we are living in a crying out loud, globalized United States, extremely cosmopolitan, multiracial, multi ethnic and, and then the medical field as well is not sealed, it's not hermetically uh, you know, removed from the global realities of what internet, uh, internet technology is bringing. And, and I'm in touch with many of our former graduates. We all stay in touch through Facebook and whatever. And I hear about, I'm very interested in their jobs and their working arrangements. Lo and behold, they are using software all the time. They have to be productive. They have to develop relationships and produce deliverables. They need to do this in a disciplined way, and they have to be very facile with it. So, so I was thrilled to do this, and, and that's, that's part of my mission teaching the course, is to get across to my students that there are vital skills that you're going to have to take away from this. You know, these are most sophomores. And sophomores. In two years, I told them, you're out of La La Land, and you will have to compete. And you will have to get out there, and you know, the space now means nothing. Um, it's interesting. People say online or face to face. To me, face to face means FaceTime. <laughs> Especially with my family in California, my wife's family in Germany, yeah. face to face yeah. means nothing. I say in class and online. In class, where we're actually in the room. But can any of you think, think, well, I can't think of one. Can you think of for me of a job in which the employee is pinned to a chair? for hours every day, quietly listening, and sometimes participating with the boss, who does a lot of talking. Uh, a lot of jobs? Actually, minus the boss talking. Minus yeah. the, but that's it. But that's it, yeah. You're in what place. job have I just described? Uh, I don't know what you made this my Customer service, um, I answer your phones, but then they're on the three You got it. Right? Where they're actually, no, no, no. I mean, sometimes bosses and various team leaders, you know, project managers will get people together, but it's usually about dispersing aspects of the deliverable. And now, off you go to get the job done. So that's what I tried to do with this. I was thrilled, Rebecca Davis, to hear that line that you said about teamwork is so necessary, and teamwork is what usually doesn't happen in the traditional law law and classroom. Um, sorry, I'm not being passive aggressive. So anyway, um, um, the design process, I, 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 I'll, I'll go through the notes to honor them. Um, the design process, so just what Chris said, the goal was not to replicate the in-class experience, but I need the same content and I want to have the same time and the same control of time spread over 15 weeks. Um, um, so we'll get to that, and I'll show you an example. Teaching on my class in the traditional age population. So, so for years I've been teaching people of different ages in the e through the evening programs um, and through the online programs. Um, I didn't want to treat them any differently. What I told them is, you're adults, so get the job done, all right? And I started with these exhortations, you know, and I cite my students who who say, you know, Prasad, I'm not good at school, but I'm good at work. I said, yeah, I'm sorry, this is your job. And you're paying me to get it done. Mm -hmm. So, so practice your professionals. I'm so glad you said professionalism in the morning. Uh, professionalism. I want them to develop this. So that that was um, that that was the way I handled this issue. Fifteen week format I already touched. <coughs> Academic integrity issues. Of course, we all know that cheating is right. And I tried to vary the kind of assessments and use whatever software tools include um, that I could in order to. Um, Dissuade cheating of all of all kinds. 
I won't claim that I had 100% success, but you know, um, through, through the audits and uh, through the checks and through the variations in grade performance, I can't say I saw cheating on that. So I really can't say so. And you had a good frame of reference from your classroom classes that you had done previously, right? Yes, because I taught the class in the day program for, for a number of years. So yeah, that's thank you for that relative basis. Um, good, and as a student, I think that's about the classroom format, right? So I had that history behind me, seeing how they usually do so I could see that comparison. But of course, in the traditional day in class, I didn't have to do as much teamwork. I had to do a bit more. But guess what? The deliverables, the assignments were completely so much better when they worked in teams. And uh, through Blackboard, through SAFE assignment, I had um, a whole archive of certain essay questions, short essay questions built up over the years. So that one, one team suddenly turned in something that had been used the year before. I was able to tell them, you are being plagiarists, and you immediately fail all of this. You fail this on the spot. Um, this happens again. The letter goes to the dean, and I will recommend your expulsion from the, from the university. So the one instance, at least, that safe assignment can catch of uh, plagiarism, that could be caught relatively quickly. And then I'll come back to teamwork. And the business of having um, teamwork uh, is, is that different people have different functions. And they have to be accountable for those functions. They have to document what they did from week to week. And that was just part of um, student Surprises. I didn't really have any. Did you have any, Chris? No. Um, OK, my surprise was that we had so few surprises. Yes. That was. Yeah, I was I was waiting for the bomb. I was waiting for the meltdown, for the for the reams of emails that kind of never came. Uh, the thing worked pretty darn well. If I saw others contemplating this path, um, I couldn't have done it without Chris. There's no way. So if any institutions were there contemplating this, make sure there's an automatic paired relationship with an instructional designer, a computer support person, with the faculty member. That's the, and that's been a policy from the very beginning, correct there. Mm -hmm. And and that that was also really pleasurable. Having a partner, right? We academics, if, if most of the professors in the room, we often, oftentimes we do everything alone, right? We have rare moments where we actually do team work, but this is a thoroughly enjoyed the team part of it. And that's how we did it. And I don't know what you think, but a lot of people think that he looks like Martin Freeman and that I look like Benedict Cumberbatch. So, <laughs> so, so we played it up. We, we had a couple of, we had a couple of, um, um, you can say, yes, yes, yes. 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 Oh, this fall, I'm going to be Dr. Strange. Right? You know, this movie's coming out. Anyway, um, so, so for some of the panoptos, I, I literally put on a Sherlock Holmes hat. He had his black, he had his black leather jacket on. It was, it was, it was just wonderful. All right. Um, I'll go into Q&A, or should I, can I just You're show that for us? Let's see. And then, let me switch yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so is this a sensitive mouse, kind of? You can either use that thing or it'll be this. All right, so I'm assuming general knowledge for Blackboard. Just want to show, just recommend a couple of other things that he did set this up. Um, this was a later element after we had little geography quizzes. And how do I see what I got? And Blackboard was very clunky. But this is great, where Chris just sent me instructions. I put it up right the first element here. This was the student orientation folder that Chris told you about, and that was great. And the other thing that I couldn't recommend enough is the mark as reviewed button. And what I conveyed to them is, you're accountable. Right? The way it's set up, you can't just cherry pick and do something here and then jump to the end, put in your discussion post, and don't use those things, and then move on. You, everything, there, everything in there is an action item. It's a content item, and you will review and you will mark it as reviewed. So no one said, oh, I didn't know about that. No way. Everything's marked as reviewed, so they got the training of everything here, and that went really well. Sorry. And then the response of uh, lockdown browser for the four little geography quizzes and for the final exam, that thing they had to show confidence in, and that, that was all set up in the beginning. And so what I highly recommend, and which I think should be policy, especially at the State University, is the use of learning modules. Because of course, the progression of the, of, of the items that you move through is automatically controlled. You can't jump around and claim to get lost. I won't show you week one, because there's so much in week one. I just want to show you kind of a typical week. And as the course, um, there was, a, by the way, I had this Pinterest element to help them search for the interest of the course. Week one set up the whole course and set up and presented for them all the instruction on how to produce their final presentation. 
So they did group writing, they did solo presentations, PowerPoints with narrations, what they call uh, recorded narrations, and then they had uh, um, only 10% of the grade were these, were these four geography quizzes, and then the final 15% was an objective test about all the material that they had written about and about all the, all the presentations that they had given together collectively for the last few weeks. And then at the beginning of every week, um, I would do a panopto to kind of give them feedback on the week they just finished and give them an heads up on what's coming in the first week. And, and all those things, um, I really tried to make it just like a very friendly and formal chat. And I would get all of these invited students to come to my office hours just to say hi. And I also offered um, uh, a lot of coaching when it came to teamwork because a lot of them were very hesitant about teamwork. I mean, really hesitant. And I'll tell you the most gratifying thing for me in this class was that towards the end, um, how many emails I got from students saying, you know, when I saw that there were 10 assignments and 40% of the grade writing things as a group, I thought, oh no. And I had some students come in and say, I'm a nursing major. I don't want to have my grade mixed with other people. I'm like, oh, really? I think you need to work on teamwork. How many of them then wrote to me and said, I was dreading this. It was the best part because I coached them through it and I would share research with them about team dynamics and crap I learned in MBA. And we did this very stuff like that. Uh, and, and saying, and you guys can do this too. And 20% and of the grade, they monitored each other. They got, it's not a participation grade, it's a team grade. So one thing Chris set up for me over on the left is the private journal. They were to write, and I told them, if someone is writing coattails, if someone is is just a drag. If someone isn't communicating and turning in their part late, write them up and flunk them. You have to grade each other. Write them up. Of course, the average grade they gave each other was an A minus. <laughs> then with the teams where, and most teams got them wrong. They really didn't have a problem. Only a couple teams had a couple people that just didn't perform. They were treated accordingly. And a, only a few teams had the real stuff. The person where each person in their private journal, where only they could see and only I could see it, said, this person supported everybody. This person was always there to help. Whether he or she was the editor of the week or the designated leader of the week, this person was so great. We were having a trouble here, and she, she sensed it, and she met with this person outside. It was great. And, and the other thing about teamwork is, so they're, they're, on, they're on campus. It didn't make a difference. Most of them, and they, all right, um, you know, Blackboard has its group work area, so we set up wikis and all this stuff and group emails. Most of them, the groups that I figured out, they all had iPhones. They just co coordinated through an iMessage. Uh, others said Google Docs was the best way to work. Where there were issues, they maybe had a five minute personal meeting. And then the person came back to me and said, oh yeah, she's cool, we straightened that. And, and they tended not to meet. There wasn't this issue of why should we do this here when we see each other. Well, the campus is big enough so that they don't. And they're busy enough so that they didn't. And they were happy to be able to do all the courses and clinicals and everything, and then to get their work done, have the leader of the week break it up and designate it, and then so that they could be on time. <laughs> so they, they appreciated that, and I kept reinforcing for them, this will be your future. You won't, you won't be a solo agent of problem. You will have to work with people, and they might be geometric, uh, ge geographic based. All right, um, let's just show you week two. All right, um, and everyone, this is just how I do it. I have the item, I have the to do list. Just do it, right? <laughs> you have your readings, you have your Panopto presentation in which I discuss the study questions of the week, and those questions are usually critical and evaluative. Sometimes I give them an easy one, like describe. But most of them are evaluative or, or critical, and then I would give them tips relating the text to the questions and how best to sculpt the questions, right? Um, and then, then I would have a PowerPoint slide presentation that we put up there as slides they could download, or Chris, God bless him, you can see down at the bottom, um, he streamed all these things. So there are two ways to get it. 
here's the panopto of me coaching them on how best to use, to go through the content, to answer the question. And then here's the slide presentation that can be streamed. Here's for the, for the slides that you can download. And that's where I used all the visual materials around the talk, and I tried to, and I tried to, um, I, I used, I used the TIG, I think that one's okay, um, that, that one's all right. Anyway, I tried to, I tried to make it as real to them as possible, and, and, and I was, oh, by the way, use this, so I give tidbits um, to answer a certain question, this or that. And then I, I added, this was something that occurred to me in week one, we really need to have a cover sheet. So the cover sheet would go on where each person in the team, for accountability's sake, would say what they did to complete the work of the week, and every week had to have a designated leader. And I left it up to them. Are you going to share editing? Are you, who's going to do the organization? Who's that? But everyone should have the, the, the role of being the leader. I didn't want that team dynamic to develop where Miss, Ms. or Mr. or whoever, big mouth, takes over the team. We've all seen it, right? Takes over the team and does all the talking, and everyone falls in silence. Um, and that tended not to happen. And then we get the same sign of the thing is do. And so that's a good 10 weeks of a course. Those little heads up videos, how long were they? They weren't long. Um, oh, the, the heads up ones? Yeah. They were, I mean, I always try for five. They ended up being over 10, sometimes 15 minutes. Um, let, me, let me go up here and go back to this. Right, so we had the 10 weeks all the way down there, heads ups in between, and then we shifted gears after week 10, I'm sorry, after week uh, 12. And the last three weeks, weeks 13, 14, and 15, they had to do um, what is the role of this country in the 21st century? That was the question of their presentations. And they were supposed to have been learning about this thing, you know, using Pinterest and using other kind of content searching um, uh, tools to learn what's going on and then to relate that, that country and, its, and what it's doing and its place in the world today related to what they've been learning. Um, I, I need to work on this because most of the presentations were really bad and off the topic. Um, mm -hmm. I, need to, I need to tie this in. I thought it was enough to set it up, I thought it was enough to set it up in week one and to get them to refer, them, to remind them to do it, but they mostly put it off to the end and I'm, I'm disappointed with those. But I think what I'll do is help uh, parts of them do earlier uh, and to have that be graded. But anyway, the point is, each class, they'd sign up for, um, they'd sign up for a course, and, I'm sorry, for the country, and then they were due in week 13, 14, and 15, I'm sorry, week 13 and 14, the Asian countries in 13, uh, and Maya, Europe and Middle East, and then the Americas is week 15, and that was the content. And so they put, they put up on the discussion board and howling errors I could correct right on the entry for that presentation, like you know, the girl who said there were two trillion people living in Spain. <laughs> that kind of stuff I could correct on the spot. Um, and then, uh, the, um, right, and then down here for finals week, um, we had this 15% this of the grade, but then this was the time when, all right, fine, so you just wrote your piece of the deliverable of, of the assignment from week to week. You better study the whole thing. You, you guys did all this. Your whole teams wrote this stuff up, study that, content, two-thirds of the questions will be based on that, one-third of the questions will be based on the presentations about these countries. And I compared the countries of the 21st century to each other and made general statements about the others. And um, we got a real wide range of performance on the final, which shows me that you know cheating wasn't such a big deal. And with respondents and monitor, you could audit their little faces and see where they were. And to listen if there was any noise. And I warned them, if you're not in the uh, I try to, that uh, this, this software will record it. <laughs> right. So, so that, that's kind of how we did it. And uh, I think that's going to be the best PowerPoint presentation. Now, as mentioned, we, we, we uh, did a panel discussion on our own campus actually two days ago with the other two faculty members as well. And it was interesting because each of them took a different approach. They had a fair amount of freedom other than that general agreement that we had talked about at the beginning and the fact they were paired with one of our instructional designers, but they were free to kind of use their own style. And there were definitely differences from instructor to instructor. For example, out of the three of them, uh, the, the one that was more the English class, the fiction class was more writing assignments for assessment. Brendan has described his. And then the political science class, he had more objective type tests, but he had them do an on-campus final. So they had to come and do the traditional final. Of course, we had the luxury of doing that because they were all campus students. So he did it that way. Um, and yeah, they all had, again, slightly 
different uh, approaches. So, uh, so it was good. But yeah, questions? Um, it, you, maybe you guys want to come up here and maybe I'll even. Yeah, we got a load of time, so let's talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, I'll ask a question on turning lights up. Yeah, that's good. Um, I know that there were three uh, sections of your history class. I presume you didn't teach all three of them. Of course correct? I did. No. Um, so how was it working with other faculty who were I using did. the course? You did teach all three. Oh, yeah. you did teach all yeah, three. Yeah. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. No, I did. Oh, oh, no. Wow. And then I have a fourth class, but that's the same. Yeah. So this is a 4 4 look. Yeah, no, and I've, I've had 4 4. Yeah. And, and you get up to 30 kids. Yeah, in some ways, having three of them be the same. Practice. I was hammered, but I didn't repeat myself for nine yeah. hours a week, mm -hmm. right? I did a lot of emails, so much grading, and I was ready to kill myself. But I set, I set myself up for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that was, yeah. A so lot. that's actually a, a good follow up question. What might you change? In this class, having experienced three teaching modes, would you do anything with any of those assignments to reduce the grading without hopefully reducing the effectiveness of the overall learning experience? Uh, the, the grading, I'm just the amount of it I'm, mm -hmm. for the special root work, I'm just going to take in tow. That's part of the job. Yep. But I, I do have to do a better job of prepping them for the presentation mm -hmm. because they, they need to get more out of it. Which you're talking about a, a signature kind of thing. This would be something they could take with them. and. Uh, very few produce something that they take with them. Mm -hmm. so I, I, they, they can. They, they can do it. So they need to do more. A couple of things to remember about the demographics of the students because we started, their average age was 20, so they truly were the traditional age student. And I think it was something like 80 some percent of them were juniors, uh, if I recall. And they were a whole variety of majors, but like 26% I remember were nursing. In my class, it was a sophomore. So mostly sophomore. Maybe with sophomores or juniors. Like 70% sophomores. Yeah, maybe with sophomores or juniors or 80%. Yeah, so, yeah. Sorry. I have two questions for kind of at an institutional level. The first is you said to sell 1,600 of your traditional, more on the daytime youngest. And how many of you are there? Uh, there are currently two of us. There are two of you for 16. There were at the beginning. Of there were at the beginning. There were originally four. And then we had two of our department leave. Okay. Uh, part and then, into the semester. Will so. they be replaced so you would end up with four? We're hoping 40, so. 1600. That ratio yeah. really interests me a lot because all right where I am is 1600 regular day and we're getting ready to go online for our grown ups and summer for a day. So my, my other question was in terms of to some, how, how do you think you've started a virus? Do you think other faculty are going to kind of be intrigued by this and be interested? What's your sense of? Well, we might have started a virus, but I'm not sure if it's a positive or a negative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something catching. So it depends who's caring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. out of the three, the three faculty members, um, one of them, um, at this panel discussion for the other faculty, he said uh, basically it was a terrible experience and he was glad it was over, although he did say he was going to do it again. Um, <laughs> this is a guy who says everything. <laughs> but the other two were, were, were Brennan and our other faculty member were, were positive on it. So uh, how about new new people wanting to sign up? Well, we have so far we have two more. Well, one of which is Brennan again. Two new course titles in the fall, um, and probably three more in the spring. And then of course we hope to start reoffering because we figured to. I forget. I figured how many sections we need to run to be able to. Essentially, five percent of all our course offerings would have to be this way in order to meet the objective of every student being able to take up to two courses. So we're certainly a long way from there. We're going to kind of build toward that. So we'll know when the course and these courses instantly filled up. By the way, as soon as they hit the schedule, they were filled um, instantly. That's how Brennan ended up with three because he was willing to do it. Um, so we'll know we sort of reached saturation um, when the classes don't all fill up. Um, a couple other policy decisions we made too. They, the university decided that first semester freshmen were not allowed to take these courses, okay. um, but that was about anything it. else in terms of policy that you? No, other than that, you know, the, again, the university wanted the courses, these sort of core courses that were frequently ran and things like that, to be the ones, not some special esoteric elective, mm -hmm. because they're paying for the development. They want it to be for three people or whatever, or however many the minimum to run. So, will you? reconsider the maximum enrollments for them at all? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think that's going to be a tough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one faculty member at our last presentation said, it really should be 17. I'm like, yeah, well, smoke a pipe. <laughs> 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 You're never going to 
yeah. back off uh-huh. from 30. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Chapter 12. Lucky I know. It's a different it's situation. It's different. It is different. Yeah. So, have you, a few questions. Have you taught online before? Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. So you already had that. And then, so you were used to the whole sort of developing an online course. Yeah. And how long in advance of the first start did you start development? Oh, we started the semester before. And, we, and that's the way we signed up. You sign up to teach it two semesters away because really to build it and to do that, it took a whole semester for it. But having done that, of course, I'm going to rerun it. Now, yeah. And then I'll get well, yeah, no, yeah. That. So I mean, I think this is like one of the things that, you know, we've just, just moved an MBA to a low residency. You know, we're struggling to get courses developed <coughs> every month. And it takes a long time. It takes a long, that's a long way. Did you, um, and did, I, I like the first semester freshmen who can't take them. Um, did you do any other screening of students before the getting to the thing in the course of is online right to use for you? And no. like, did you have people that like dropped after they did Destin? There were there were people that you know we had probably like most probably just sort of a drop, free drop ad period. Yeah. So there was some flux in the beginning, but the, the, the ones that did it enough in advance, the slots just got refilled by other people that were waiting to get in. So in the end, the, the classes all had very close to thirty in them. They had like between twenty eight and thirty all the five sections that that ran. But there wasn't any other screening. None of these courses I don't think had prerequisites, did they? Um, did you sort of figure out? Yes, because it's the second of the okay. history track, so that, that was there. But, but there was no GPA or anything in like the that. first week. Didn't I mean, the first thing to do is put up on a discussion board, introduce yourself, answer these five yeah. questions, put up a business casual salary. Those who didn't do that, I emailed to them. Um, clearly, you're not in this class. I'm I'm dropping you now and letting someone in off the wait list, and that got them to respond. <laughs> <laughs> and said, I don't have time, and and who will? Who will they go to work for? Say, you don't have to do that. <laughs> I don't think so. So I, my, my expectation is for them to grow up and be as responsible as, as possible. This isn't, you know, this academia may be law or something, but it's going to end very quickly. Yeah, Good. Good. Uh, uh, so I, I, I'm hearing two conflicting things. One is that you go down very generously and thoughtfully all sorts of advice and guidance and safety nets and steering and your presence. And at the same time, you took the attitude that you rightfully described a moment ago. On the one hand, so uh, it strikes me there's a bit of a tension there. Yes. Um, but my bigger question is, uh, is it too much to have all this guidance and um, support system built in, perhaps more than is, would be built in, in a normal sort of face-to-face class. I'm not sure how, you, how one would evaluate, is there too much? Um, I suppose to answer the first question, the reason why I do it is that that's what I'm paid to do. Um, I'm paid to help these young people improve their skills and their knowledge and get them ready for the next step. That's part of the job. And did I put it too much? Well, I probably would say this. We got much, far fewer decent apps in this class. If the sales, we give up five minutes. It's not where A is adequate and B is bad. Um, uh, we got far fewer in this, but then again, it was a very different environment, very different learning environment. So um, and it's a very interesting question. I'll have to ponder it more. I wonder, I mean, I wonder if, and I think you're looking at the same thing, right, that it's all that sort of stuff that happens in face-to-face class, but you don't have any documentation of it. Now you had to. So and so you're circuit, you're doing all those supports in a face to face, and you can do this sort of just in time help and react to how there's that that look of confusion on your face. Yeah. But when you're online, you can't, so you have to. It's a you have to make it explicit. So on online makes it become explicit in terms of the support that a good teacher gives their students when they're in a class with them. And well, and it's also possible there's something called creative flowering in a liberalized environment. You know, you, you, yeah. you want to cut them some slack so they don't. Discover something for themselves. Maybe inefficiently, it takes longer. You know. Right. And this kind of model doesn't allow for that in some ways. Oh. I think they can get behind. They can get behind and then discover how hard it is to. Well, and I don't mean this critically. This is sort of a thinking aloud puzzle. Yeah. But I mean, your presence is constant. Yeah. Despite all. You know, not even. I don't mean you personally necessarily, but the way the system works. Yeah. 
it may be true if that's the future of work, that, and that may not be so desirable. That Except that's the benefits the, work. If you count it for minutes, my present is constant, no more than 42 a week, which I suppose, maybe in some fields, that's all the management you'll get if you're on certain sales teams. I do know students and friends of mine who are working with. They don't see their boss, but boy, do they have some intense interaction about once every three days for mm -hmm. about seven minutes. Mm -hmm. And they, that, okay, that's, then I know what I'm doing. But I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say, well, I don't know. If they watched me again and again and again and again, they would get the presence of it. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be. You mean you necessarily, like the way your interventions are structured mm -hmm. in, into the whole mechanism of the course. Uh, Again, with reminders and follow-ups and, mm -hmm. yeah. and ways that are much more um, continuous than they would be in a regular sort of course. I think. You're right. Because in a regular course, you're, if you're seeing that two or three times a week, yeah. they have that built in, but in an online, yeah. they don't have to show up for class, so you're replacing that structure with a different And I know, I mean, yes. designing online courses, you know, the thing you explicitly designed for our instructor presence, and you design clearer, more transparent structure, and it's substituting for the you're not in a seat. The back row doesn't have the luxury of falling asleep and having me notice it and then take those steps. Mm -hmm. I can't tell who's falling asleep. I can't, do, I can't tell who's doing something with what the game is while the game is on, but the teams will definitely turn in someone who isn't performing. Right. And just to kind of like add to the difference between like, you know, having an in-class session and having those kind of like underlying, like not always in your face signifiers of like, you know, helping and assisting, it goes back to me as a designer, I always allude back to the door interface design problem. Perfect design. If you want someone to stumble around and getting into a room, you give a panel door with no push or pull bar. Right. A well-designed door with a signifier will have a push panel or a pull bar. And the thing is, is that you know, if you put these online, if you take that setting online, you have to plan for those signifiers because then if people start failing, is it really the person's fault? Or is it because the dot designer didn't implement their end game as well as they could have? And that's what I would try to work for at the end of the day, is, you know, this is the student's experience. Don't take the sage on the stage approach and assume everything about them, build for their success. Because at the end of the day, if most of them have stumbled, a large percentage, it could very well be mine or the instructor's fault because we didn't plan well enough for them to succeed. So it's a certain give and take point with that. Well, I think it's like a similar perspective. I sometimes say that when we're talking to faculty groups, is because you get sometimes you get this some kind of question or comment about, well, how much do we have to spoon feed them? You know, this idea of spoon feeding them, and I always make the point that there's a difference between intellectual rigor and just a poorly designed course that people are like yeah. fumbling around in. You know, it's not intellectual rigor because they can't follow, they can't find the instructions to do the, to do the thing. So I think that's sort of what you're talking about the same way. You know, you have to have this structure and that's not really babying them. Because the other thing you don't realize is all the informal instructions you do give them in those three hours a week, every week, a question comes up and you, you have to, like it was pointed out in one of the other sessions, you have to be much more explicit in these online classes, not because the people are, you know, different or, or dumber or being spoon fed, but it's they don't have that same opportunity to ask the casual question that you don't even remember as an instructor that even occurred, um, but it's constantly happening in the class. I don't know if that's your perspective, Brad, since you've been there. But you all, um, my, my institution has, has bought in, if you will, to quality matters um, as, as the standard there and the um, uh, guidelines of training. We're not probably going to be able to do certification because too much of our accessibility is not accessible. Um, and that's one of their standards. But they 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 did give us a really taking part of our, our criteria for being allowed to teach uh, an online course is that you must take one or two quality matters courses. And so turning turning me into an online student was just a profoundly uh, changing experience in terms of my perspective and needing that kind of help and structure and clarity of design and knowing where to find things was extraordinarily helpful. And I didn't think I was being um, spooned to that. I thought I, I was able to judge, can I get what I need out of this class? But I was curious if you as an institution have, have um, taken 
somebody's somebody's rubric or somebody's standards. Yes. Yeah. So we, we do have a course um, evaluation rubric that we use as we have a kind of a course review process that we do in our department, mainly for mostly for new faculty members or faculty members that are teaching a particular course for the first time. Um, so that's for face to face as well as for no, just for online or hybrid. Okay. Yeah, and we and we. So we have this rubric, but we did liberally borrow from um, Quality Matters and Online Learning Consortium and some other rubrics that are out there. And uh, actually, we just modified it too, which maybe would be a future presentation or something. Because before, we try to keep it a very collegial thing between the instructional designer and the faculty members, so it's so that they'll come to us and not feel like we're the police or whatever. But we did incorporate just this year a scoring mechanism, and we're hoping that'll be useful. Uh, to allow us to assess ongoing progress, both institution-wide and, and according to standards, just like Quality Matters has like certain standards and then requirements. Yeah, we a certain amount of each standard, and it's, it's, it's an interesting system. Because with our other thing, when there wasn't any numbers attached to it, there was really no way to see right. if as a whole we were getting better or worse or whatever. So that's a new thing, and especially our accreditation is coming up, and we see this as a nice continuous improvement process. And hopefully it won't mess up our non-adversarial relationship. Of the instructional design. How did, you, how did you get the strategic? How did how did you start with getting buy-in from the people who control money and the, I don't know, just for that objective that, itself? Uh, yeah. How did you get that much strategic plan? Yeah. yeah. We I don't you know I've been at the institution for two years mm -hmm. and that objective was in the works. I don't know how long before that. I mean, maybe you were, I'm not really sure where it originally came from. It was a long time in coming, and I'm not even sure who was the original. This, I've been at this institution for 15 years. It's been a very tech friendly institution. I have no prestige. <laughs> Who the hell is there to say? We don't have Greystone. <laughs> <laughs> no mock gun. We don't have. We have no Captain Hepburns. Are you kidding? So, we do have Steve from Blue's Clues. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, Steve from Blue's Clues. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. We do. Well, hey, we're building it up. <laughs> So yeah, the, the, the leadership of the institution has been very tech friendly, but we we haven't been trying to build some magnificent library collection. It's, but we've really tapped into um, sharing this library as much as possible. So where they've where they've uh, set their energy is of course getting uh, getting the machines, getting the tech, and then encouraging faculty to use it as much as possible. It, it, that is how the sales MBA program went from small and regional to the second largest in Pennsylvania. Wow. Um, through that tech. Yeah, people are very, very friendly in the faculty toward uh, technology by and large. Um, and part of it is because we have these other programs that the faculty teach in, usually, you know, maybe overload or whatever. Um, and so there is enough interplay between the day faculty and these other programs. So it's a very positive atmosphere. Well, especially to you. But we have, <laughs> plenty, we have plenty of faculty who say, you're giving up once you, once you master that. <laughs> you get it up. No one will do this. This is terrible. These, those devices don't belong here. Are those your older faculty or your younger faculty? Uh, it or depends either? on uh, the field. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. Anyway, the, the most tech savvy professor I know of colors are class six professors. But anyway, it's it's you're, talking about, you're talking about the Appleton. <laughs> 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 But, um, okay, so question. Um, by trade, I'm an academic technology specialist, but I, uh, my graduate degree is in English. So one of the values I'm always trying to peddle to faculty about online learning is, I think in the discussion forums, when you're having to learn to communicate without, without um, social cues and, and different things like that, I think that's tremendously valuable and transferable into their careers. And I think almost more so because we're doing it in front of each other. So that self-consciousness they have with social media enters into that classroom. And so I almost think there are more benefits from a writing standpoint and online. And I didn't know if you shared that perception or disagree with me. No, I totally agree with you. I, I don't know, uh, sorry, confessions of an old academic. I do have this sense, this deep sense, that all the, all the writing, all the deliverables that I learned in the 80s and then in grad school in the 90s are in the workplace obviously. So when, when it comes to writing, when it comes to writing, when it comes to writing, I do encourage them, don't give me a, a, 
a leisurely introduction. No, answer the question. I give them big no. questions and minimal space to do it. Right. And they have, and I really push on them the skill that you rarely find among anybody of the topic sentence that grabs the reader by the ear, that answers the question and tells the reader, shows the reader where you are going. And of course, that's one they should write last, but that's something I hammer on all the time. And lo and behold, some of the teens and some of the kids really get that. And you find that so rare, and that is so powerful in rhetoric, whether spoken or written. So in the writing style, very much, I, I really try to tell them to be as concise with, with language as possible. Don't use words. Don't use words like hoary. Right? Come on, this kind of crap academic whole job. Like it is, like but it? who says this? I, I do. do. Well, it's <laughs> fun. <laughs> 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 you know? It's fun. Yeah, well, <laughs> right. Sorry. And I have a question about the, the teamwork component. You yeah. mentioned that they found out a, a good experience in this course. Yeah, and uh, so a couple of quick questions on that. One, how much of an individualized grade is it? So you have these private journals going on in the background, mm -hmm. and you know how much do the grades vary maybe within the team? And then also, do you share the feedback and obviously back to the team or the individuals about how they were rated by their peers? Are there any kind of great question? And please give me guidance because here's what I did. I said it's worth 20% of your grade. I didn't tell them that we start with certain number of points and that they would lose. I didn't say that you'd be, you would get the grade if people gave you. What, at the beginning of the class, when it was time for team grading to be done, when we, when we finished up the teamwork, and I said, now is the time you start entering your journals. What I did is I said, all right, now you write each other up. You can give each other a grade if you choose, but I want comments on how each person in your team performed. And I said, if you just give me grades and no comments, I don't count you. So I need extensive comments, and I got extensive comments. Feedback to the students that didn't perform well. They got their feedback at grading time when I basically took that 20%, and that was my discretion, in which I made sure that their final earned grade from, from the quizzes, from the tests, and from the writing assignments would go down a half if they were, if they were the drag, or went up a half grade. Right? But that 20% you can play around. You can really shift something. And I explained, and I explained them to a general email, this is how it's going to work. And I did get a couple of students saying, I did a great job, and I was counting on 100% in this. And funny how in two out of those three cases, they were not the team player. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I probably should do a better job about conveying performance. But at the same time, I suppose, doesn't this put me in a sticky situation of letting Portions of grades come from the students. Maybe yeah, we shouldn't go there. But in the online space, what am I supposed to do? Do you have solutions for teamwork? Oh, so I, no, I just have a kind of like, uh, in my communications class, I did use this when I had team projects. It's not all of them, but one of them says, um, if you're on a team and you're the drag, you're supposed to fire you. And then you have to try to get hired by another team, but automatically oh, your grade is going to be lower and you're like, that. you're. You're like, you know, the contract faculty or the contract, uh, not faculty, but you're the contract worker now. You don't have the full time job and you're just pounding your life. So if you want to go on with a life metaphor, then take it further. That, that's you know, I mean, I think this is the reality of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are actually some companies that are structured that way. I forget, I remember in an organizational uh, behavior class I was involved with, uh, it was either WR Gore or Google or one of those kind of companies that worked exactly like that. You could get fired off the work team by your colleagues, and then you have to like sign on with another one. So uh, that is a powerful motivator. But what about like, looking at revision history in a Google Doc to see the contributions of the students? I didn't ask to see in Google Doc. What I wanted everything turned in was a Microsoft Word Doc, so okay. just to give me the final part, but I really put emphasis on that cover sheet with who did what, and every member on the team was supposed to sign off and check off on that. Okay. Then they say, yeah, and, and for the person where there was no entry, there was no entry. So where there was no entry that week, the team members got the grade, that person got that. Mm -hmm. And then I go, oh, well, this happened and that happened on the, why didn't you tell your team? Yeah. Why didn't you convey any of that to your team? This is not my problem. You have a team member problem, get on top of it. Unless, of course, it was, there was a dire family emergency, which in this case, it wasn't. But that was only one week, so they were able to recover. And again, that's what a good team does, is right. 
it understands when you have that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I have a question. Um, you started with a sort of overall strategic goal for doing this, which was um, because students would, you know, prepare them for graduate and professional development in the future. Um, to sort of help build those kind of skills. So, are you are you tracking that? And if so, how? So, can you tell that you achieved those things? No, I think the, the, the architects of that objective were assuming that that would be the result of doing this. So, and so far we've only had one semester of these three sure. classes, five sections, so we haven't done it. Maybe that's a good point. It, although, I guess it would only be in retrospect down the line. Maybe. How would you track? How, yeah, how well, yeah, you no, I mean, I think that's a really I'm, I'm open to suggestions. I mean, I think it's an interesting idea. I think I did, we did a, a, a little research project I'm trying to do, and I collected some data around this whole thing. And there was one pre test, post test survey that we did around um, comfort and familiarity with technology. Yeah. Um, so I haven't had a chance to analyze that yet to see. You know, so basically, it took the same assessment at the beginning and the end to see if any of those things you know, moved the needle you might, significantly. I mean, you might even be able to do this sort of, are you ready for online learning? I mean, there's some standards that are there. Pre and post test, do you feel uncomfortable? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, because I think it's a very much an attitude thing. But, um, well, this but I would certain... be curious to see. I was, I was wondering how you would assess that. Yeah. Did you say you had the benefit of seeing now the like, course evaluations from yeah. the students? You must have yeah. just got those a lot of yeah. too. So yeah, what was the general tenor of those compared to, again, your normal? Uh, they, they came in by mutual average, just, just slightly above the university average. So it's really the comments that kind of stick out to me. And it's, it was surprised the students over the pleasure of the teamwork. It was the part they were dreading the most, but it's also the part where they, and I really emphasize in the weekly heads ups, and I would show them some of the designs of well-functioning teams. They're really cool sociological studies. They, they, they um, get work teams and they pin on, they pin kind of beacons on them. And that, that, that counts not their heart, but it does the heartbeat thing, like how stressed out they are, but also how often they talk relative to everybody else. And they really, um, they track the, the encounter of these work groups, uh, the encounters of these, work, of these work groups, physical and otherwise, over weeks. And they found, lo and behold, that the best performing, the most productive teams are not those where there's one person kind of doing it all the time, but those in which activity is shared. And so I'd show the kids that and say, this is going to be the future. You're not, you know, when you get out and someone will pay for your services, you won't be sitting with your ass in a chair and then, and then taking these assessments. That's over. We're doing them a disservice if we think the way you earn grades is the way you earn money and the way you survive Right, and the way you survive in the organizations. So I don't care if it's a corporation or an NGO or or a, or, a, or any type of volunteer organization. There are organizations and there's competitions. The workplace. So I really try to get them to be thinking that way. 